that other mic. Okay. So great. Thank you uh, very for the very kind introduction, uh, Sarah. I, of course, don't use the doctor. I'm only allowed to use that in an honorary fashion, and I have one from here, so I guess we could get away with that. It's always, uh, it's always a pleasure to come back, uh, return to my alma mater. Uh, whenever I'm here, I like to tell the students that uh, actually 35 years ago in April, I had my last class on a Friday. I moved on the weekend and on the Monday I started at the Globe and Mail and I just had my 35th anniversary there. So, so that's how it should work for everyone, right? You just graduate and life goes on. So what I want to talk about this morning is, uh, actually I was going to change my topic and talk about the stress of travel as a transportation industry melts down, but uh, maybe we could do a future symposium on that one. But I want to talk about uh, what COVID-19 can teach us about climate change. So two of the big issues of our day, uh, how do they intersect? And specifically, I want to talk about how the pandemic can experience can teach us about talking about climate change, because I'm more of a communications person than a science person, so I'm not going to delve into the, the nitty-gritty of climate science or, and its health impacts. I'm going to leave that to others who are much more qualified than me. But I'll focus instead on the communication challenges of an evolving global public health disaster, or two, or three, uh, depending on how monkeypox goes. Now, in short, I want to talk about risk communication, the difficulties of communicating uncertainty, which is something we all need to, to wrap our heads around uh, going forward. Now, by this point, you've probably noticed I, I don't have any slides, and I'm not even panicking. So I want you to know that uh, this isn't a technical problem, it's a choice. So I'm just going to talk, and uh, you can have your fill of slides later from other people. Now, as you know, we're in the midst of what's arguably the worst pandemic in a century. And I say arguably because pandemic uh, COVID-19 has killed officially 6.3 million people. Uh, the true death rate we know is probably about three times that number, so around 20 million. And the pandemic is far from over, unfortunately. But, you know, AIDS has killed more than 37 million people. Sarah mentioned AIDS. That's kind of been the arc of my career for, for 40 years now. Uh, who knows the toll of poverty? We don't do a good job of counting those deaths. Climate change will likely be deadlier than all of them when all is said and done. And that's a pretty grim thing to think about, but reality. But there's no rapid test for uh, death by planetary neglect. Uh, and mortality is just one statistic. You know, in a global public health crisis, death is just the, the tip of the melting iceberg, if you will. Uh, there is and there will be much mental and physical suffering, uh, economic harm, ecological damage, and of course, unanticipated consequences. You know, COVID really taught, taught us that. We just really didn't know what was going to happen at the next turn. And that's been taking a real toll on us more than anything else. COVID's impact, we know, will be felt for decades and in ways that I think that none of us can fully understand yet. You know, the great influenza of 1918, 1919, uh, the definitive book on that wasn't written for 70 years because we didn't really understand the impact and we're only still understanding uh, that uh, crisis of a century ago. And I'm, that's why I'm a, big, I'm a big fan of medical history because I think it could teach us a lot about what will happen in the future uh, if we study the failings of the past. And the, the echoes of uh, 1918 and uh, 2020 are, are quite frightening. They're very, very similar uh, in the responses, in how the virus spread, etc. And we seem to have not learned those lessons. Now, COVID's impact, as I mentioned, will be, we felt for decades. Uh, climate change, probably even more so. Uh, it's literally going to reshape life on the planet. Even if we make our best efforts, it's still going to have a dramatic impact. Who knows how we'll react? Could anyone imagine the way we reacted to COVID? I don't think so. Uh, we can do projections, projections of temperature changes, melting glaciers, rise in oceans, spread of infectious disease, and on and on and on. We know a lot of bad stuff can happen and will happen. But I don't think we can fully really imagine the fallout because we, we don't have the right calculator for that, for seeing into the future. And that's one of the scariest things about climate change, I think, is the unpredictability and the uncertainty. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is Yogi Berra, who said, uh, you know, I hate to make uh, predictions, especially about the future. <laughs> and I think that's, that's something we should be wary of with climate change. We should be careful about what we predict because we really have no idea. There are so many variables. But that, that doesn't mean do nothing. On the contrary, it means 
be ready to change and adapt constantly. So how do we as scientists, academics, journalists, concerned citizens, how do we convey the severity of this risk when there are so many unknowns? And more importantly, how do we do it in a comprehensible, engaging and convincing fashion? How do we give the public uh, l'heure juste, as we say in French? Uh, how do we do it in a manner that doesn't leave us all consumed by gloom and devoid of hope? I think that latter is probably the hardest one. So let me start, to, to answer those questions, let me start by talking about COVID, you know, something that has left us, I think, only semi-devoid of hope, uh, and something that's consumed my life and probably a lot of your lives to varying degrees since about December 2019. I remember very distinctly tweeting about uh, COVID on December 31st, 2019. Uh, like, oh, this looks a lot like SARS, just like my colleague Helen Branswell. We both had the same thought having covered SARS 15 years earlier. Little did we know how different it would be from SARS and how much bigger an issue. But anyhow, there are many lessons that the pandemic has taught us uh, in the last two and a half years, and I think many of them can help guide our, our response to climate change. So let me share about a dozen random observations in no particular order, some of the lessons of COVID. So identifying the problem was relatively simple. Uh, we pinpointed SARS-CoV-2, the virus, and we decoded the genome in record time. Science, you know, rocked. But science was the easy part. Uh, getting politicians and policymakers and the public to act on scientific knowledge was a lot more challenging. I can see all your gears moving. How does this apply to climate change? Well, obviously. Uh, COVID taught us that we're way better at reacting than we are being proactive. Uh, and, you know, always reacting is pretty inefficient. We learned that technology matters, but no matter how good the technology is, it has limitations, especially if people reject it. The most dangerous epidemic in the world today, I think, is the epidemic of mistrust not any virus or temperature change. Uh, the, the pandemic taught us really dramatically that misinformation is deadly, that people have short attention spans and politicians have shorter still attention spans. We've learned in recent months that we've become pretty inured to death. Yeah, a bunch of people are dying, a few thousand a day, about 60 a day in Canada still, but we've moved on. We're not interested anymore. 40,000 deaths in Canada, more than 1 million in the US. All just a shrug now. There's a lot of unexpected collateral damage, as I mentioned before, especially to our mental health. And we're gonna hear more about that today from some great speakers. The single most powerful tool at our public health armamentarium is the same as it was 200 years ago. Good communication. That was driven home time and time again. I think we learned too that language matters and language evolves. We're gonna have a whole new language for climate change, uh, words that we're already learning. And my final observation on the uh, random observation is beware chicken little. And I'll come back to that one. So let me discuss each of these points briefly, but apply them to a climate change lens. When a new disease emerged, you know, finding the viral culprit was easy, as I mentioned. We identified SARS-CoV-2, decoded the genome, figured out the symptoms of the illness, uh, how to treat it more or less well. And later, you know, we've learned about the chronic version, long COVID, which is a much greater concern than we thought. But of course, there are people who didn't accept this science, no matter how solid it was. Uh, there were some who were downright anti-science, but most were just skeptical or confused. COVID doesn't exist, it's just a cold, it's just the flu, has a 99% survival rate, etc. These dismissive phrases fill my Twitter feed every single day. You know, we know what's causing climate change too, a buildup of greenhouse gases, largely because we burn too much fossil fuel. And of course, I have to give a mention, uh, passing mention to cow farts because <laughs> somehow in the media, we love that story. But anyhow, we also know the symptoms. Yeah. Rising temperatures, more extreme weather that causes floods, droughts, wildfires. Did I mention windstorms? No. Uh, displacement of wildlife and so much more. Uh, there are also climate change downplayers and deniers. They argue that temper changes, well, they're just cyclical and normal. We'll adapt. No big deal. But let's be clear. Climate change is real and it's undeniable. 
uh, we spent far too much time and effort writing the its real stories over and over again. And we haven't spent enough time hammering home the fact that there's broad scientific consensus on the problem and the solutions. You know, COVID, with COVID, science was the easy part, as I said. We have centuries of evidence of how to deal with infectious disease. And we knew pretty quickly how we could contain, contain the spread of a pandemic virus. Physical distancing, limiting interactions, masks, vaccines, to name a few. Similarly, with climate change, we know how to mitigate the damage uh, by cutting fossil fuel use, reducing emissions, changing our lifestyles, and more. There's some debate around the edges, but not on the main. It's pretty broad agreement. So we have to stop perpetuating this myth of disagreement. Uh, that doesn't mean climate change is not incredibly complex, multifaceted, uh, and so on, but, you know, because it is. But that doesn't change the fact that we agree that on all the basics. So let's stop denying basic truths in the name of balance. That's false balance. And I think we in journalism are at least getting a little better at making that distinction. Now, another COVID uh, lesson that we learned, or at least that we were reminded of, is that people don't like change. They don't like to have their routines curtailed and their luxuries denied. They'll tolerate restrictions for only a very short time, and then they'll rebel. You know, this individual freedom stuff is problematic, especially for a city like Ottawa. But it's problematic for COVID mitigation, and even more so for climate change. Reducing your carbon footprint means what, practically? It means less travel by plane, by automobile. It means smaller homes, less stuff, more modest diets. Those are tough, tough sells, and most people will resist this kicking and screaming, unfortunately. There are those who will argue that technology will be our savior, that we can slow or reverse climate change with things like electric cars and bike lanes and Beyond Meat burgers. But like the COVID response, we have to stop pretending that individual acts matter as much as policy decisions, because they don't. Uh, COVID was really humbling for the technology will save us crowd. We developed the most sophisticated vaccines ever in record time, but they've been no match for a wily little virus and small-minded anti-vaxxers. You know, I don't think we can science our way out of the climate crisis. There has to be a concerted effort by governments. Uh, there needs to be bold plans to dramatically reduce carbon emissions, not just fancy new technologies uh, like Tesla's. You know, is that going to happen in a world where our so-called leaders don't even have the backbone to make masks mandatory in crowded indoor spaces? Uh, I don't want to be a doomsayer, but I seriously doubt it. We live in a world dominated by the religion of economic growth at all costs. Uh, a world where our gurus are multi-billionaires and oligarchs who control vast multinational corporations. What's the incentive for them to change? You know, governments are no match for them and their greed, especially if we have governments run by kleptocrats. And I won't mention the country to our south of us. How will we ever take collective action against climate change in an environment where uh, there's widespread distrust of institutions and experts? You know, now we're all experts in everything. When you don't like facts, you make up your own. We call them alternative facts. I never thought I'd hear those words in my lifetime. Climate change deniers like anti-vaxxers thrive in this environment. During COVID, we all became amateur epidemiologists and virologists. And now, moving forward, we can all be amateur biologists and climatologists. And we can believe whatever we want. We can create our own reality the meta world or something like that. Now, denial is a powerful emotion. We've seen that during the pandemic too. It's also an adaptive reflex. It helps us survive. We want to be right. We want to be comforted and not scared. As a friend of mine from Newfoundland of, is fond of saying, denial is not just a river in G Egypt. It's part of our daily lives. Yeah, that is corny, but what the hell. You know, humans can adapt to almost anything. Uh, we don't blink anymore at thousands of motor vehicle fatalities each year, or a million tuberculosis deaths, or millions of pandemic deaths. We shrug them off. Uh, the horrific can soon become nor normalized, especially when it's wrapped up in misinformation. Now again, this is a problem that has to be addressed on several levels, uh, from investing in science literacy to regulating social media. You know, as a journalist, you won't be surprised to know that I'm a proponent of free speech. I tilt towards the civil libertarian in that area. But there are still limits to free speech. 
Uh, for one thing, it should be reserved to individuals, not corporations or bots or anonymous trolls spreading hate and lies. Uh, it doesn't extend to hate speech, racism. Even free speech advocates don't say that we should be allowed to scream fire in a crowded theatre, or for that matter, to stand outside a burning theatre and say everything's just fine, to the point where we impede access. And that's what's happening with COVID and I think with climate change. Now, social media has brought us many benefits, but we have to find a way to make it civilized, if not a totally safe space. Because as I mentioned earlier, one of the key lessons of the pandemic is that the misinformation really is deadly. You know, why have more than 1 million Americans died of COVID-19 when we have vaccines? In large part because they're in denial, uh, because they've, become, they've come to believe self-serving lies rather than obvious truths. What will happen if we believe the lies being perpetuated about climate change? That there will be, well then there will be a hell of a lot more than a million deaths. We can bet on that. Still, to repeat as what I said earlier, we have to pay attention to more than the top of the pyramid of suffering, you know, all those deaths that happen at the top. To me, the, one of the most surprising impacts of COVID-19 has been the so-called collateral damage. The way the, uh, the fear, the disruptions, the isolation and the grieving have really messed with our minds in ways we couldn't imagine. Uh, there were mental health challenges in our society prior to the pandemic, we can't deny that, but they've been multiplied incredibly in the last couple of years. I learned a new term yesterday from the New York Times, psychic numbing. How the seemingly endless stream of mass tragedies uh, is such that we've lost the ability to feel normal emotions anymore. That's, that's a really troubling concept, but one we're living today. Uh, the impact on mental health has been particularly acute and visible with young people. You know, the Greta Thunberg generation not only cares a lot about climate change, they're really taking it to heart, as they did with the pandemic. I think we we've neglect to give them credit, because no one has taken the COVID-19 pandemic more seriously than young people. And few groups have suffered more, except uh, elders, obviously. Uh, Self-reported levels of depression and anxiety are through the roof. Uh, we see a lot of stories these days about a pandemic of mental illness, uh, you know, the, the next wave of the pandemic being that. But I think we have to be cautious with our language. I think it's real, but we have to be cautious. You know, we shouldn't pathologize normal human emotions. Sadness is not depression. Worry is not anxiety. Disappointment is not suicidal ideation, and so on. You know, humans are very resilient, and young people particularly so. So let's not deny them the chance to, to be resilient. I think what's real and disturbing are the levels of climal, climate anxiety. Uh, so too is the message sent by young people who say they don't want to have children anymore because they don't want them to live on a dying planet. Those, when I hear those stories, they break my heart, maybe because I have children of that, that age uh, in the mid-20s who say things like that. This sort of nihilism is unnerving, but it's also not surprising. Young people have every right to be angry about the state of the planet they're inheriting. The levels of psychic numbing are also a reminder that climate change is just one of the many, many mass tragedies we have to routinely deal with. Uh, I won't even mention the school shootings. That makes it all the more important that we not allow ourselves to be merely nadering nabobs of negativism, as what once said about journalists. In our coverage, in our research, in our politics, we have to offer solutions. We have to offer hope. If we don't, what's the point? You know, I worry about relentless doomerism. It makes it easy for people to give up, to tune out, and to drop out of the discussion. And that would be the worst possible thing. Another important pandemic lesson, we're not going to scare people into good behavior. On the contrary. Earlier, when I rhymed off my list of pandemic lessons, I said, beware chicken little and promise to come back to that. I wasn't referring to the animated movie, but to the old folk tale of the hen who, when an acorn falls on her head, assumes the sky is falling. When we exaggerate, we risk losing people, even reasonable people. Yet we live in an era where hype and overstatement are now the norm, where every acorn is a falling sky. Again, that doesn't help us. The other folk tale I should reference while I'm at it is the boy who cried wolf. If we constantly issue false alarms, 
then people won't be paying attention when there really is an important development or threat. So we have to ratchet down some of this fear-mongering. You know, I know why we do it. We do it for, uh, we're well-intentioned, but it's going to backfire if we do it too often. Now, I'm in an audience of many academics, so I've got to quote some academics, not just my musings. So let me start with Edward Maybach. He's the director of the Center for Climate Change Communication at George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia. I have to do that in Globe style. I can't just say his name. Now, he says people need to know five things about climate change. It's real. It's us. Experts agree. It's bad. And there's hope. And I thought of just reading those five lines. That's pretty well all I have to say in my speech. I'm just saying it in a more long-winded way. But, you know, I think those are, are really important points to remember. Uh, for far too long, we've presented this as a two-sided political debate. If you're right-wing, you essentially don't believe in climate change or you think it's manageable. If you're on the left, you believe it's real and tragic. But it's not, it's not that simple and it's not that simplistic and we shouldn't allow ourselves to, to fall into that trap. Uh, when a debate becomes or a discussion becomes politicized, especially in a partisan manner, solutions become nearly impossible. So we can't handcuff ourselves by saying, ah, it's just a right-left debate. Uh, it, that will allow it to just become dogma and allegiances, and there will be no collective problem solving. And that's what we need. We need collective problem solving. Now, again, we saw that with COVID, especially in the U.S. Democrats, Democrats get vaccinated and wear masks. Republicans say all that stuff is pointless because the pandemic is over. It's just the flu. And if you repeat those bromides often enough, you actually come to believe them. And we run that risk with climate change as well. You know, we spent decades reporting on calamitous reports from the IPCC, uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and on COPS, the United Nations Conferences on Climate Change. Again, another globe rule. We always have to spell out acronyms. But over the years, what's changed? You know, the language of the reports has become more rhetorical and alarmist. Uh, the conferences have become bigger and even occasionally interesting uh, when a fresh new voice captures our imagination, like Gre Greta Thunberg. But, you know, it's her time up soon. Have we become bored of her now that she's an adult? But has there been any appreciable change between the official reports and the large-scale summits? Uh, have all the treaties earnestly signed by countries actually slowed climate change? I'll leave you to answer those rhetorical questions yourself. But we need to find a better way of covering climate change between the IPCC reports and the COP conferences. You know, we're getting pretty good at covering climate events. You know, so-called once-in-a-century storms, wildfires, droughts, heat waves, and all manner of weather events. Practice makes perfect. Uh, we have journalists who now do this full-time. What's the weather event I get to cover this week? Yippee! But we need to do a better job of contextualizing these disasters and exploring the larger impacts on our mental and physical and planetary health. Now, admittedly, it's far easier to cover short-term disasters than long-term ones. People get bored quickly, as I mentioned before. When the Derrico, or is it Derricho? I'm a print reporter. So I'll say Derricho. When the Derricho calms, uh, the bomb cyclone passes, the atmospheric river dries up, or the heat dome bursts, we move on to something else. But we shouldn't. We should linger and try and understand why it happened and why it's going to happen again. You know, the trauma doesn't go away, nor does the underlying condition that created the disaster go away. The way we cover climate disasters and disasters more generally is also very skewed, and we have to recognize that. You know, several years ago, a large study of media coverage of disasters yielded a statistic that's often quoted. 45 times as many Africans as Europeans need to die in a disaster for it to merit coverage in the U.S. and probably Canada. And I think that number is probably an, an understatement. But that, that ratio is disturbing. We just don't pay attention to most of the world. Now, the researchers found there were three principal reasons, or excuses if you prefer, for this differential coverage. One, cultural proximity. You know, we identify more with people who are more like us. As a result, Western consumers of news will care a lot more of a disaster in Paris or in Ottawa than one in Lagos. 45 times more, apparently. Though I would say it's probably 100 or 1,000 uh, some days. 
Number two, geographic proximity also matters, mostly for technical reasons. Uh, you can get a satellite truck up and running in Ottawa or Miami in a few minutes or hours, but it would take days or maybe even weeks and hundreds of thousands of dollars to do the same in Juba, which is the capital of South Sudan. So we ignore the world because it's complicated to not ignore it. And third, the issue of newsworthiness. That's always a dicey one. Uh, it's the secret sauce of every newsroom, and it's frustratingly impossible to define. Uh, you may know the expression, I don't know art, but I know what I like. You know, that's a bit like our news meetings every morning. Editors get together and they decide their priorities. And there's often no logic or rhyme or reason to this. There's stuff that grabs you and other stuff that doesn't. Uh, stuff that you feel you've heard it time and time again. And that's why it's so difficult to cover these ongoing crises. We get bored. Ah, haven't we done that story? Aren't we sick of COVID and climate change? Eh, haven't we done the Greta Thunberg story enough times? That's what ultimately guides news coverage around the world. It's probably the toughest barrier to overcome. It's a subjective determination and all kinds of biases come into the calculation. So are the decisions of the Western media, are they, are they racist and elitist? Yes, to a certain degree, but not often deliberately so. Just practical and unthought, uh, not thought through, etc. Short-sighted, if you will. Uh, what my bosses would tell you is there's nothing wrong with producing stories that people want to read. It's a business after all, but we have to find that balance. And I also like to remind people all the time that, that the media is not in the business of education or in the business of information. And those are very different things. And the public doesn't always grasp that or, and it can be frustrating, but it is an important distinction. So let me quote another academic. Dr. Mike Evans, uh, he established the Health Communication Lab at the Lee Ka Shing Knowledge Institute in Toronto. Uh, and he produces these wonderful whiteboard videos. He coined a great aphorism. He said, stories trump data, relationship trumps stories, and individuals trump organizations. I think that's a really important phrase. What he means is that individual stories are what capture the public imagination, especially if people can identify with that person. You know, we see that especially in these, these shooting stories. They're all about people. Statistics are abstract. People are real. That's why journalists love anecdotes. But the ideal story has three elements. Uh, it just doesn't have that, uh, what we call, uh, humanitarian porn aspect to it. You know, it has a good human story, yes, but it has to have solid data. And I think more importantly, a solvable policy issue. I think remember that when you're pitching climate stories, they really need to have those three elements to, to be really meaty stories or beyond meat stories, I should say, maybe. I don't know. <laughs> now, how officials communicate during disasters also matters a lot. Uh, risk communication is an art form, especially because individuals have different perceptions of and tolerance of risk. Again, we saw this in COVID, and we see it with climate change. Now, the def dictionary definition of risk is the possibility of suffering harm or loss, danger. A more modern and timely definition comes from Peter Sandman. He's a professor at Rutgers University and the guru of risk communication. He created a formula. He says, risk equals hazard plus outrage. Now, hazard is pretty easy to measure. It's a mathematical formula most of the time. Uh, for example, the r naught of Omicron is about eight. What that means is every person with the virus will infect on average eight others. An easy calculation. Now that's a high level of infectiousness, of infectiousness, but it's still a moderate hazard because you have a low chance of actually getting really sick or dying. So people, you know, see that information and they process it in their own way. What's a lot more difficult to measure is how they process it, that outrage or fear, which is what drives outrage. Uh, people were a lot more scared of the original uh, COVID strain, Alpha, than they are of Omicron even though the latter is six times more infectious. But people don't do that kind of math. Uh, language matters a lot when you're conveying these issues. Uh, so do headlines and kitchen table conversations. It's all about perception more than data. 
Now, health professionals and scientists know what words like epidemic and pandemic mean. They know what global warming means and uh, carbon capture, etc. They're all technical terms. But for the public, these words can often mean something quite different. Take the word epidemic. Uh, what that means for most of the public is we're all going to die a gruesome death. That's a loaded movie of the week word. Uh, and when it doesn't happen, people become skeptical. Ah, oh, things aren't as bad as they told us. Epidemic, schmepidemic. I'm going, getting on with life. We have to find that balance in our communication. Uh, there's a similar problem with the discussion of climate change. When you say a two degree change in average global temperature is catastrophic, many people are like, well, like my brother, to be honest. Two degrees, that's no big deal. Who cares? I live in Northern Ontario, two degrees warmer will be great. You know, they don't necessarily understand the difference between weather and climate or about long-term impacts. We lose them and we lose them at our peril. Now, when talking about health threats, we need to find words that ratchet down fear rather than ratchet it up. We have to give people actionable things. We have to be smarter about how we communicate with the public overall, but we tend to make the same mistakes over and over. Now, Professor Sandman notes that the single worst thing you can do during a disaster is tell people not to panic. Now, that might seem counterintuitive, but I've been in disaster zones all over the world. Wars, plane crashes, mine cave-ins, floods, tornadoes, you name it. I've rarely, if ever, seen panic. It's not like a Hollywood movie. What I've seen is a lot of eerie calm, and frankly, that's a lot scarier. Uh, paradoxically, the only thing that causes people to panic is telling them not to panic. Because they wonder, what are you hiding from me? It doesn't look so bad around here. What, what's going on? Now, Professor Sandman conducts seminars on crisis communication for business and government leaders all over the world. He says there are essentially six key strategies to good crisis communication. Don't over-reassure. In other words, don't downplay the potential risks. But don't exaggerate them either. You can talk about worst case scenarios, but what we should be doing most of the time, what would be most helpful, is to talk about most likely scenarios. And I think this is a really important one for climate change in particular. Let's not always do the, the, the chicken little. Let's do some of the, here's what will probably happen. Number two, he says you have to acknowledge uncertainty. Uh, the three most important words in public health, and in medicine for that matter, are I don't know. I don't know, but I'm gonna try and find out. Honesty is actually reassuring for the public. It's not frightening. Three, we have to treat the public's fears as legitimate. Don't be dismissive of people who say, yeah, what's two degrees? Explain to them, try and engage them. Don't be dismissive. Don't ever say people are stupid because they aren't. They maybe are not sophisticated. They maybe not have the education you do, but they're not stupid. Number four, express your own feelings. You know, the biggest mistake that academics and public officials make is being dispassionate. That doesn't engage people. It makes them suspicious. Five, offer people things to do to protect themselves. Now, what fuels fear and anger is powerlessness. So give people practical advice. Give them things to do. That's the best way to get through a crisis. And finally, the one that I already covered, he says, don't worry about panic because panic is rare unless you create it yourself. Now, these are tips for crisis communication, for responding to short-term disasters, but they also apply to slow simmering disasters like climate change. The most important message, I think, in all that is empower people. Uh, in journalism, we do a poor job of this. We don't do enough solutions-based reporting. As I mentioned earlier, we focus a little too much on individual behaviors. Uh, it's more empowering to give people practical actions they can take than to tell them, you know, we're all going to hell in a handbasket. Give them stuff they can do. Uh, don't just guilt them about burning fossil fuels in their car. Uh, talk to them about ways of cycling safely, uh, the need for infrastructure that would make that possible. Put things, put solutions in their reach. You know, don't make people feel bad about destroying the planet because they're heating their homes. Do better coverage of clean energy alternatives. Make them affordable. Make them part of public policy. Don't just rail about polluting corporations. Talk about the power of divestment and how you can have an influence. At the same time, we can't shy away from uncomfortable issues that arise uh, when we address climate change. 
For example, what's the role of nuclear energy as an alternative to fossil fuels? That makes people squirm in their chairs. You know, can the bad guy be rehabilitated as the lesser of two evils? Tough questions, but we, we shouldn't sidestep them. Are electric cars really more environmentally sound alternative uh, than fossil fuel burning cars? I don't think we should accept these arguments at face value, especially when they come from Elon Musk, to be honest, because we may regret this uh, years down the road. As I mentioned, there are often unintended and unexpected consequences of our actions, however well-meaning. When we talk about solutions to climate change, we can't sidestep the realities of a profoundly inequitable world. Again, something driven home dramatically by COVID. 17% of people in the developing world, one vaccine shot. 90% almost of the developed world have three or more shots. It's just, it's perverse. You know, people in developing countries want better lives too. There's gonna to be environmental consequences of that. Should they be held back because Western countries have been irresponsible and selfish for centuries? You know, if Canada and Saudi Arabia can keep pumping out oil, why can't Nigeria? Why, why a double standard? If using an asthma inhaler is bad for the planet, and it actually it is, it's about the equivalent of about a 300 kilometer car ride, should patients get less effective treatments? Or should we crack down on car drivers so asthma patients can breathe easier? Tough questions, tough trade-offs. There are many of these possible trade-offs and many, many difficult choices to come. We should be sinking our teeth into these debates, not shying away from them. We shouldn't be afraid of uncertainty either. And I come back to, to Peter Sandman again. Not everything is black and white, and that's okay. People deal with greys every single day of their lives. Let's not underestimate their ability to manage uncertainty. You know, the greatest challenge of our lifetimes is going to be tackling human-induced climate change. We know that. You know that in this room, especially. Emissions cause carbon buildup, that causes temperatures to rise, and various changes in weather patterns. They affect us every single day. Don't have to be reminded in this city. But there are varying degrees of uncertainty about how this will all play out practically. The timing, the pace, the severity of impacts is all largely unknown. It's a big guessing game depends on so many variables. There may be even benefits, like milder winters in Canadian cities. And there'll be opportunities for new green industries, different ways of living. And it's okay to say that. We don't have to be all gloom and doom all the time. In fact, at the risk of repeating myself, it's imperative that we not be nihilistic. Defeatism robs us of agency. You know, as the IPCC said in its latest report, if anybody got to the end, I'm a journalist, so I started at the end, but uh, they said, addressing climate change is the greatest public health opportunity of the 21st century. And failure to adequately address it could undo the progress of global health over the past century. Risk, opportunity, I have to find the, the balance. The overarching message in everything I've said this morning is that the most important we have a weapon we have in the fight against climate change, or any public health threat for that matter, is and always has been good communication. So embrace it, learn how to do it properly. Uh, all the great research in the world will have no impact if you can't communicate it effectively. You know, of course, the research matters, the reports and the conferences matter, the political action matters, our individual gestures matter. But none of this will happen unless we engage the public in conversation unless we convince them of the importance and urgency of addressing climate change. Without profound culture change, we're going to fail. You know, our language matters, our words matter, and our stories matter. And I'll finish with a quote, not from an academic, but from a, a fellow hack, uh, Richard Black, the BBC's environmental correspondent, uh, because he said this so eloquently. He said, it's as hard to find the right language to convey climate change as it is to explain love or describe jazz. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't try. So thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I am sorry again for making you late uh, starting. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andre. Uh, to moderate the next session of Q&A, if you want to just stay on the stage, we're just going to take 
a few minutes of questions. So uh, Dr. Zach Patterson is here over to, the, to my right, and he'll be moderating the Q&A session. So hopefully you have some good questions at this point. There we go. We're open up for questions. Thank you very much, Andre, for a very uh, interesting and insightful talk. Uh, Dr. Abizade, start us off. Uh, it's really, really tremendous talk. And, and really what I am taking aback is that sentence, that, that the science is the easy part, and the hard challenges lie in the action and communication. Uh, one of the things that I, I mean, we all have Twitter accounts, and one of the things <laughs> that we all get is this counter communication or this sort of flooding of information that is spread the box and the people that are that have specific interests that essentially are trying to give voice to fake or, or to false ideas that fight what you know we're all trying to solve here. So how do we fight that? How do we get how do we get our voices heard when we're trying to communicate uh, the science, for example? Yeah, I think that, I think that's one of the big challenges of our time. I don't think I think we're at kind of a low point in communication. We haven't figured out how to f uh, deal with misinformation yet, but I think we're getting there. I think we some of it is regulation, some of it is people acting differently. Uh, I like to remind people that the spreaders of in misinformation are my generation. They're people fifty plus. They don't have any discretion or smarts about this stuff. Younger people are way smarter than this. Uh, they know how to. They know how to navigate Twitter. Uh, if you look at Instagram, most kids' uh, accounts are private. They really, you know, they're more skeptical than we are. So I, I think this is going to be a self-resolving problem. I like to think we're at the bottom because it's pretty mucky there now. I hope it doesn't get any muckier. Uh, so I, I think this will be resolved. We've had communication challenges. You know, uh, I, I said I, earlier I'm a big fan of reading history. When uh, Gutenberg uh, developed the printing press, a lot of people panicked, you know, about how uh, stories were going to be spread too far and wide and this would be a disaster. And this is the same thing on steroids. So I, so I think it'll, it will resolve itself. But in the meantime, I think we have to be careful. Uh, I think we do need some regulation. Uh, you know, getting rid of bots, that, that would pretty well solve of all of Twitter's problems overnight, right? Now, why do they don't they do it? Why do they not do it? Because their numbers would go down dramatically. But if advertisers wouldn't punish them for that, if they would recognize there would actually be a benefit for that, I think, it again, it would solve itself economically. So we'll have to see what, if Elon follows through, his promise to get rid of bots. So uh, if he does that, we'll see. But then he's a... I'll said he'll allow people to say anything, including yelling fire in the theater. So we'll see. So no, no easy answer on it, but I think a lot of it is going to come down to changing our culture of communication. And I think young people are always already way ahead of us on that, on most of us. I believe we had another question right Yes, here. thank you. Hi, my name is Beth Chalecki. I'm an assistant professor, associate professor of international relations at the University of Nebraska, Omaha. I'm here at NIPSIA on a Fulbright, and so I'm pleased to be able to attend this session today. But I'm trying to square a couple things that you said in your excellent address that I can't seem to square because they apparently contradict one another. You said that information is not education, and that information is the media's business, not education. That we not need to ramp down the words that incite fear, and that media is a business. And I can't make these things go in the same direction. Being from south of the border, um, the land of school shootings, I'm sorry to say, I see what happens in the media, and I know that there are people, especially in the state I teach in, that will not believe in climate change because the media tells them otherwise. They're captives of this media ecosystem that disallows any, any disagreeable opinion or any contradictory evidence. How do you square those three things, given that three things don't make a square? <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Uh, you know, the way I square them is, I was trying to get the, the point across that we're not in the business of education. It doesn't mean it doesn't happen, but I think it happens more incidentally than, than deliberately. And I think we do have a, a bigger role in providing education. I think we saw that in COVID. We did uh, a lot more what we call service journalism, like just giving basic information, how to get shots, et cetera. We have to, that was very popular with our readers. I think we've learned a lesson from that. We'll do more of it. Uh, the distrust in the media. I, I don't know how you solve that exactly. I think it's way worse in the U.S. than in Canada, uh, thankfully. But if it, it is a business, I, I don't think, you know, we have state-run media in Canada, CBC, our state finance. Uh, you don't have, you know, you have uh, NPR in the U.S., but it's more public-funded than, than state-funded. But I, those aren't the solution. I think we have to make 
uh, an ecosystem where it's profitable to publish good information. And I think, to me, the most alarming thing that's happened in the media is it's uh, really mirrored the, the real world, where the, the rich have gotten richer and the poor have gotten poorer and the middle has disappeared, right? So all these small town papers are gone. Uh, the community papers are thriving because they publish crap, to be honest. Uh, and then the big papers, the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Globe and Mail, they're thriving. They're doing really well. So you have to figure a way of making those more accessible to the general public. They're, they're unaffordable for many. So I think, I, I don't know exactly what the solution is to that, but part of it is, I think, or a large part of it is addressing this crisis of trust. Uh, if, you know, when people tell me, oh, I don't trust the media, I said, well, what, what do you trust then? Like, I don't care if you don't read my paper. Don't tell my bosses I said that. I, I don't care, but what do you read? And do you honestly think that's better? Like, if you want to live in this echo chamber, go ahead. But I, I think, uh, and I think we've, again, we've seen this COVID. I think people have recognized the benefit of, of subscribing to a newspaper. Like, newspaper subscriptions are way up, especially the big ones where you can get information. Uh, TV viewing of news is way up. So I think there is some hope there. But it, it, you're right, it's not a, an easy circle to, to square or whatever the expression is. But because there's lots of elements. But I, I, th I think, again, uh, I'm, maybe I'm an odd journalist, but I am hopeful in that, that regard. I think people are, uh, you know, the pendulum is swinging and people are embracing general media more because they recognize the, the dangers and the, the folly of living in a bubble, or especially a Trump bubble. Hi, um, that was an incredible talk and I really, really liked it. Um, so my question is kind of off the same um, that she just mentioned, but um, my question to you is, do you see media and um, just news like changing over time the way there are, because um, it's a business, right, for them, and they want to publish the story that gets the most hits. Um, do you see it changing over time? Um, and uh, do, you, do you have any ideas of how we can bring about that change as individuals that watch? Uh, or Because I know personally a lot of people that have stopped listening to the news or stopped even reading news because it causes so much anxiety on them that they feel like it's better just not just to switch it off. So I, I just want to know your views on that. Yeah, I think you know I think the media has like in my I've been around 40 years so a long time, but it has changed really dramatically, especially in the last decade. So we used to be very strictly an advertising model. All the money came from advertising. Uh, that's gone. Facebook sucked up all the advertising. Now we have a subscription basis. So it's really changed the uh, the relationship between readers and the publisher. And I think that's actually made for better journalism. Uh, we do a lot more long investigative pieces, a lot less daily news, you know, the, the quick hits. Anybody can get that for free on the internet. So we have to make the papers and the, uh, the news stations uh, because TV is also fragmented all over the place. You have to make it something people will pay for. So it has to distinguish itself. So I think that's actually been good in a way, although it's killed lots of publications, unfortunately. So I think that's changed. Uh, and I think that also the way we cover things has changed. You know, this uh, we used to talk a lot more about being objective and balanced and stuff. And now we're much more nuanced about that. We talk about being fair and being accurate. Uh, we don't give a voice to anti-vaxxers today the way we did 30 years ago, where it's kind of just routinely stuck them in. Well, vaccines don't work. And now we, we challenge things. And I think, uh, I think Trump forced us to, to make really dramatic changes in the way we report. Because when someone just lies, then you have to report differently. You have to call out lies. You have to correct uh, misstatements. You can't just be a megaphone for misinformation. So I think we're still learning that. I think we still make mistakes, but I think we're getting much better at it. Now, the, the big question, the, the billion dollar question is, is that going to be profitable? And I think what we're learning is it's been profitable for a few big corporations, the New York Times, et cetera, but it's not profitable for little papers. So I, I don't know what the solution is there. I think we have to find one. So so it's a tough, a tough area. If you think, uh, writing about climate change is difficult, try writing about the, the media e ecosystem, because it's changing really even more quickly and it's much more dire, to be honest. So you guys have two degrees of temperature change and we have about 57 degrees. So. Hello there. Um, 
you mentioned something I found very intriguing. Um, I'm, I'm quite interested in mental health and mental wellness. And you, you brought up this idea about lingering, that we need to linger um, in, in the stories, in, in public health crisis, in, in COVID, we're like getting kind of blase about it. And I'm curious, how do we linger and thrive when we think about it? Like it's kind of building on the last question where we're constantly also being bombarded um, with looking after our mental health, our mental wellness, but lingering can, requires vulnerability and can be painful. And given the topic of the conference around stress and trauma, I'm curious what some of your thoughts are around that. Yes, I, I think, you know, if I again approach that from a, a journalism perspective, I, I think it's a big challenge for us is how do we write about traumatic stuff without re-traumatizing people, right? We have these discussions in our newsroom every day. This is something we didn't talk about at all five years ago. Uh, we, I'm going to directly here to a conference in Montreal, a journalism conference where the whole theme is about how do journalists take care of their own mental health. Right? We used to just, I've done horrific things in my career. I went to Rwanda for three months with an area, a thought, you know, and I saw the most gruesome things that you could ever imagine. I go to plane crashes and see bodies being pulled out of the water. And what was the answer? The answer was always, well, suck it up, you know, be a tough guy. And, and we're changing. And I think if the media changes internally, I think our reporting will, will change. I think even more quickly. I think it already has, but but these are these are challenging things. But I don't think the answer is not to write about difficult things or gruesome things. It's about finding better ways to write about them. Uh, you know, we put trigger warnings on stories now. I never thought I'd see that. Good thing. Uh, but we have to find we we have to not hide the reality, but we have to make it digestible. Uh, informative but not harmful. Again, it's all about it's all about balancing many competing interests, and not easy. But I think we are getting a little a little better at it. And again, I I often I caution. I'm making the mistake that I always tell people not to do. Uh, we don't don't use media as a single word. There's such a broad range of everything from you know the the listicles through to fabulous. Uh, uh, I'm just pops into mind this New York Times series about reparations in Haiti. Uh, you know, that's a amazing journalism, so informative and, and impactful. So there's the full range and there's lots of stuff in between. So we, we have to do a better, better job all along the spectrum. Thanks. So I think we have time for one more question. Go ahead, sir. Hi, uh, that was a really great talk. Um, as someone who consistently doom scrolls on Twitter for, in his free time, um, <laughs> Whenever a crisis occurs or whenever something happens, you see the same cycle. It's always crisis, impassioned uh, speeches. Some politicians or some leaders get put to task, but then nothing really comes out of it. Um, in, in your experience, um, what seems to be like the best way to enact like these policy, like these big sweeping policy changes, um, while also keeping the doom and gloom at bay? Yeah, so again, another tough one about balance, especially coming from someone I spend way too much time on Twitter reading about thoughts and prayers too. Um, I think it's about being relentless. So that's, I do lots of teaching at journalism schools, and I think that's something we've, you know, in this era now where we have instant news, I think we do a much poorer job of being relentless. Uh, Sarah mentioned in the introduction, I, I wrote about the tainted blood tragedy for many years. Young people probably don't even know what that is. But I literally covered that story every day for three years. Uh, I don't think that would happen today. We just don't have the attention span uh, institutionally or uh, as individuals. I, th I think we have to figure out a way of, and, and I think this is really going to be essential for climate change, being able to come back to the story every day and make it engaging in a different way. Tell another little angle. You know, when I wrote about tainted blood, there's a different little angle every single day. It's just, uh, I, I tell the students that I'm kind of like a, a human embodiment of a, a water torture test or of waterboarding. I just keep going away, you know, a little bit, drip at a time, drip at a time until, you know, finally sinks in. And, and I think that's how we have to cover climate change. We have to figure out how to just do it over and over and over until they, you know, different stories are going to different, engage different people, uh, speak to them in different ways. And we can't just, uh, can't just do the reports and then went, wait six months till the next report and then do the occasional, oh my God, we're all going to die stories. We have to just keep doing it from different angles. Uh, and the same approach to social media, you know, you have to 
I think to me the key is social media is how how you listen, right? To be wise about who you block and who you follow, and it can be really really useful. And if you don't do that, it's a cesspool that will destroy your mind. So you got to find you got to find the right way of using the tools at your disposal. Thanks. So thank you again, Andre. That was wonderful. I have lots to think about. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so we're just going to take a short break. So let's give ourselves till 10.35. You can head to the washrooms. We start just out and down the halls to the left here. Uh, there's some down the stairs as well to the right. Uh, refreshed snacks and goodies over here. Uh, we'll reconvene at 10.35 for our next uh, session, which will be our panel on epidemiological perspective on climate change. I'm sure you will uh, have an, an excellent uh, morning with our next panel as well. So see you shortly. <laughs>